we, we're just going to recognise the moment of um, turning 10 for speech bite and uh, as with TBI Express and any other research that happens, uh, these things, there is no one person who, does, who, who comes up with something like speech bite. It's a team effort and uh, so the, the members of this team comprise Kate Smith who has been our project manager. Um, Tricia McCabe, Nat Munro, Liz Murray, who spoke earlier, uh, Emma Power and Melissa Brunner. And our newest member of the team is Nicola Shelton. And we also have uh, raters who have rated our papers, raters, volunteer raters network as well. Um, so it, it really does take a village to produce something like this. And we did, as Tricia said, we built on the shoulders of Psychbite. Uh, Psychbite was launched in 2004 and I was on the founding committee of that and that is an interdisciplinary um, evidence-based practice website for all acquired brain impairment treatment research. Uh, but as we were launching that and we were working on that it occurred to me that there was no speech pathology equivalent. So there was a physiotherapy one was called Pedro, there was an OT one that was called OT Seeker uh, there were, there was no speech pathology one. So I approached Speech Pathology Australia um, in 2006 and uh, spoke to Gail Mulcair, who is still there a decade later, mm -hmm. and um, Marie Atherton was another key person who I talked to at the time, and they agreed that this might be something that's worth investigating. So they, they granted us some seed funding and I poached Kate Smith off Psychbite. She was working on Psychbite at the time. And I said, I've got a fantastic project for you. <laughs> and she said yes. So uh, I'll talk more about Kate near the end. This was the opening slide. So in, uh, in May 20, 2008, we, um, so it took two years of development to get it to a point where we could launch. Um, Professor Mark Onslow gave the opening address um, to launch SpeechBite and uh, the website looked very different then. I was into cloud, cloud skies and <laughs> blue sky and I wanted the, the sand because I wanted us to keep our feet on the ground but I wanted us to have our head in the clouds so I had this... <laughs> I thought it was beautiful but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> it didn't. It didn't stay forever. So, and this was what we were wanting to do. We wanted to develop some kind of resource for speech pathologists that was based on sensitive services, uh, searches across a range of databases. Um, we wanted to list all the treatment studies that had empirical data, and we only wanted to have trials where the population was about communication, or swallowing, or were at risk populations. Um, and so that was what we, we developed some inclusion criteria for papers that would go on to speech bites. So they had to be part of current or future speech pathology practice. They had to be published as a full length paper so we wouldn't accept a conference abstract, for example. Um, the population treated had to be representative of um, um, who we would come across in the course of our speech pathology practice. And there had to be a trial, the trial had to include at least one intervention. So we weren't going to include assessment studies, for example. Um, we weren't just including just an observation of something. It really had to have um, empirical data about treatment efficacy. And we decided to include, um, as well as systematic reviews, RCTs and non-RCTs, which were already included on Pedro, for example, and OT Seeker. Um, but Psychbite had um, brokered the way to think more broadly and include single-case experimental design studies. Um, and at a later point, we, put, we also put clinical practice guidelines on this website as well. And while there are five generally accepted steps of conducting evidence-based practice. 
we wanted to make it clear that SpeechBite was only going to help us access the evidence and we wanted to provide some appraisal of the methodological quality of the evidence to help speech pathologists with that extra step. But we certainly weren't going to um, be giving the answer of how do you treat a particular disorder. That was clearly still in the realm of um, each clinician's own judgment. So the original speech by website looked like this. I still think it looks beautiful. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, I've still got my business cards with the clouds on them. Um, You can. They're relics. So, um, so that's what we first looked like. Um, what we found when we started, so this, this is a slide before our, because we, we, we've updated it. So what we found was we, we kind of did a bit of navel gazing and we looked at what have we actually got on speech bite. And um, up until 2011, I mean, this was the thing that was, weren't we glad we'd put single case experimental yeah. designs on because they were taking off. That, that's what people are doing. And that's a bit of a no-brainer, isn't it? Because RCTs are expensive, they're hard to do, and they're not always appropriate for a heterogeneous population like the ones we're dealing with um, as speech pathologists. Um, nonetheless, there were more RCTs happening. So um, we, we could sort of see that, and, and also more systematic reviews. You can see when we first started, there were hardly any. So systematic reviews have kind of taken on a life of their own as well. So that was, we could see single case experimental designs were in, increasing. Um, we also could see things were changing. And, you know, if we sat down and did it again, things would be changing again. So e-health, telehealth were, was kind of new um, since 2008. Technological advances in the treatment of um, speech disorders the words implementation science I don't think existed when we launched. So um, focus on um, uh, uh, culturally and linguistically diverse populations, um, pharmacology, I missed that, so drug treatments for speech disorders, uh, they're, they're gradually increasing. We were getting new diagnoses being reported in treatment studies, so we had to come up with new search terms on our database. Um, and SCED ratings, so rating a single case experimental design, we could see that there was um, so many of these papers and it was extremely difficult to tell a good one from a bad one. So, um, and it still kind of is. So, <laughs> but there have been some methodological advances and this has really been led by the PsychBite team. Um, one has been in, t in terms of how to rate the methodological quality of a single case experimental design. So the Robin T scale uh, was published in 2013. Um, so Robin Tate led that work and I was certainly involved with the production of the Robin T manual, which is a whole manual in how to rate a single case experimental design study. Um, it was radically different from the first scale we came up with in 2008. Um, and so that scale is now being used beyond neurorehabilitation, beyond speech pathology to education and, and other fields. So that was one development. And the other development was the re reporting guideline, the scribe. Um, and so this is a, basically a checklist for, similar to the consort checklist, um, where, which outlines how one should report a single case experimental design study. And it's been published in uh, eight journals uh, at the same time. Aphasiology is one of them. Neuropsych rehab was another one. It went into journals across all disciplines when we published it. That was another piece of work. So um, with all that background, we relaunched again. Um, I'm a favourite of launches. So we launched in Australia and we launched in the USA at, at uh, an ASHA conference. And because we had a new updated website and Kate Smith once again led an enormous amount of work. Um, so it now looks like that, which is better apparently. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it is, it's better. It was, it was more up to date. It was more up to date. We did keep the clouds. You can see they're, they're there. Um, it, was, it was a much more up to date um, website. And uh, I'm not going to go through all the SpeechBite website. If you have never looked at it, shame on you. And um, 
go and have a look at it. Uh, but basically, SpeechBite remains freely available uh, worldwide. We have over 5,000 um, papers listed on there um, at the moment, and more than 80% of the randomised control trials have been rated using the Pedro P scale, which are, is a rating of the methodological quality of that paper. Um, we're, we're getting huge amounts of hits from all over the world, and they keep increasing, even though we're not really advertising it that much. Um, but our top five countries, I think USA is now beating Australia, um, UK, Germany, Canada, but there are, there are many others. So it got incorporated into the Speech Pathology Australia CBOS um, statement, so that that meant um, students certainly look at it, which means we get these big bi bimodal distributions of hits each year. When the students start, we can tell, because they're all starting to look up speech bite for their assignments and their clinical work. Um, it's taught in all speech pathology curricula across Australia. It's used by um, evidence-based practice networks and ASHA, we've, we're collaborating with ASHA and they use it to inform their practice portal over there as well. So we've surveyed who's using SpeechBite, how are they using it. It's mostly being used by practicing clinicians and students. Um, what do we need to work on? Well, people, you can't get the, the full journal article of SpeechBite because of copyright issues. It's a constant theme of people going, I can only look up the abstract, I can't get the paper. Um, one little window that's opening for us is these things called open access articles. So as, as funding agencies are demanding that we publish our work on open access um, sources, that, that problem is starting to be solved. Um, we're still noticing there's a lack of awareness about speech bite um, internationally. We've started a bit of a social media campaign over the last couple of years. Um, and we now have more than 6,000 followers. So if I ever want anything retweeted, I send it to at SpeechBite because I know it's going to get retweeted to lots of people. Um, we also have a Facebook page. Um, these are to be, to be done in the future. S clinicians still are looking for summaries of how do, how do you do this treatment, like what, what's, a, 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 what's the how to do it, the cookbook, how do I, how do I actually apply this. Um, so that is something to be done. We have SpeechBite, the, the famous SpeechBite newsletter, so we have about 8,000 on our mailing list to get that each month um, with our latest additions to the database. And I think another area, just when I was thinking about where are we heading with this, I think where, clin cl where clinicians will be heading in the next five to ten years will be how do we include consumers in shared decision making by considering the, the best evidence that is available. And we do not have good shared decision making aids in speech pathology, but I think we could, and I think speech I think speech bite could help inform the development of those because we've done the hard yards of finding the best evidence in the first place. So that's just another um, to be done. We've had some financial support from a range of organisations. I have to acknowledge Speech Pathology Australia who still give us money every year. The American Speech Language Hearing Association have been giving us funding. Sydney Uni have provided, I can't imagine what the in-kind support has been from them because the team has all been based here. We had a lot of initial funding from the Motor Accidents Authority of New South Wales. We couldn't have got started without PsychBite. They gave us nearly 500 papers to start with um, when we launched. We do get funding from the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists from the United Kingdom. We did have funding from Guild Insurance and we also um, relied heavily on advice from Pedro. Um, so we've had an awful lot of people to thank in terms of building SpeechBite and keeping it going. But the big person that I want to thank tonight is Kate Smith. And that is because Kate has been extraordinary. She's provided extraordinary support uh, in building SpeechBite, in maintaining SpeechBite, and in keeping us all focused and um, continuing to work on SpeechBite. And she's been all of those things and even more. She, she's, she is an extraordinary person in, in all the different elements that she's been able to manage. So. 
Kate has, um, sadly for us, but happily for the Faculty of Medicine and Health, taken on a senior position on main campus. And so she left actually fairly suddenly. Um, uh, but she's still part of our team, so I'm not saying goodbye. Um, so this is not a goodbye um, at all. She's still part of our team, but she's stepping back from being a project manager, and we're slowly helping Nicola Shelton, who is she still here? See, we've got to hang on to that. <laughs> we've got to hang on to her. But Nicholas Shelton's starting to take on some of some of the roles that, that Kate um, so ably and wonderfully did. And uh, so I wanted to take the opportunity on the decade anniversary of this resource to thank Kate very much. And if you come down the front, I've got just a little present for you. Um, so thank you, Kate. I think that's all I've got, so I'll so, hand back to you. Okay. Sure. Um, would you join me in thanking Liz and Leanne for three fabulous presentations? <laughs>